here this morning. <coughs> I'm going to uh, double up on my cough drops, one for each side. So I look like a chipmunk. Uh, every time we do yard work, uh, I pay. I pay a. Uh, I pay a price because the pollen outside just uh, messes up with my sinuses. But that's okay. Uh, just like I'm lactose intolerant, that doesn't, that doesn't stop me from eating ice cream. Uh, so this morning, uh, we're going to do some truth telling in our, uh, in our message. And I hope uh, you're sitting down for this. Uh, there's going to be a lot of truth that's going to be disseminated. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will allow you to receive uh, the truth. Uh, I want to begin in Luke chapter 7, verse 39. Our text this morning... Uh, then we're going to read, uh, turn to one more verse. I want to begin reading in verse 39. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touched him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed five hundred pence, and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him most? What a, what a question to ask a Pharisee. And Simon answered and said, I suppose, uh, he, he knew the answer, but he just didn't want to come out and admit it. All right, he says, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. Back in the day when you went into a guest's house, uh, because your feet were dusty and you were in sandals and you were walking around in the streets, they always had water pots there with uh, some cloths that you can sit there and wash your feet before you entered a person's house. And they would uh, actually have a servant who would actually wash your feet as you entered the house. And the Lord is telling Simon, when I came to your house, Simon, no one washed my feet. <clears throat> Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. And here I want you to focus on this verse. I don't want you to miss this verse. Because uh, we're going to be referring to this verse frequently throughout our message this morning. <clears throat> Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And I want to also turn to one more verse, uh, Galatians chapter 4, verse 16. Uh, give you a few seconds to get there. Galatians chapter 4, verse 16. And Paul is writing to the Galatians who had uh, gone back into the world. They had begun in grace, but they somehow were deceived in thinking that would, they would continue by works, and Paul is uh, admonishing them and telling them that they should uh, uh, try to explain to them that you begun in faith, you need to finish in faith. And then he tells them in Galatians 4.16, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And oftentimes uh, we feel this way, I feel this way. Uh, sometimes you tell people the truth and you feel like you're their enemy. They, they hate you, they look at you. And they hate you because you tell them the truth. And this, uh, let's uh, open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning's message. I pray the power and presence of the Holy Spirit be, be in our midst this morning. Be with those who are watching through Zoom. Be with those who will be watching later on Facebook. Be with those who are here this morning. And I pray that your word may go out in the power of the Holy Spirit. That what is said this morning... May he bear witness that this is your word, not my words. 
that your people may have an open heart to receive what you have for them, O Lord God, that we may understand this morning the power of truth and the severity and the hardness of truth. And may we receive it with a loving heart. May we all, after this message, have a greater desire to be lovers of the truth, to stand for what is truth. For you, O Lord God, through Christ said that you are the truth. You are truth. We thank you, Father, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There are two women in the Bible who are recorded have, of having done this to Jesus Christ. There are two women in the Bible that, the, that it tells us that they poured ointment on the feet of Christ and they wiped uh, his feet with their tears and with their hairs. They poured costly perfume on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the uh, first woman we are told of in Luke chapter 7. There's another woman also in Matthew chapter 26. Well, I want to spend a few minutes this morning to show you that there are two distinct women that did this, and this was not a coincidence. In Matthew chapter 26, we are told that our Lord was in Bethany. He was invited for dinner at the house of some, of, of some guy called Simon, and, and this guy Simon was a leper. And, and while Christ was at Simon the leper's house, this woman also came, and she poured a costly perfume out of an alabaster box upon the feet of Christ, and wiped them with her tears and her hair. And the story of Matthew chapter 26 is told again in Mark chapter 14 and in John chapter 12. And in these accounts, Jesus said what this woman did would be, would be spoken alongside the gospel as a memorial for her. This account of the second woman pouring ointment is also recorded in John chapter 12. There are three accounts. Uh, there are actually four accounts. But one account is of a separate woman. The account in Luke is of a different woman than the account of uh, Matthew 26, Mark 14, and John chapter 12. And John, in, in uh, John's account, John adds a few details. He tells us that Simon the leper was Judas's father. Uh, John 12, 4. That's the reference there. He tells us that Simon was Judas's father. And this woman who was pouring this ointment was actually Mary, Martha's sister. And uh, also Lazarus' sister. <clears throat> but the story we read in Luke chapter 7 is of another woman. This is not the same woman. We know this because the case in Luke chapter 7 occurs in the town of Nain near Capernaum. Now Nain was 5.5 miles south of Nazareth in the region of Galilee. But the other story of the other woman, uh, the story regarding Mary, occurs in Bethany. And Bethany was 2.5 miles east of Jerusalem. It also happens that both householders' names were Simon. Is that a coincidence? <clears throat> now, uh, you may be uh, tempted to say that this is the same account, but you've got to keep in mind that Simon was a very popular name back in the day. It's like if you go to Greece, and if you, if you shout Mary, half the woman will turn around and look at you. Uh, that may be foreign to some of you, but when I was growing up, my sister's name was Mary, my cousin's name was Mary, my grandmother's name was Mary, and my sister's best friend name was Mary. And my sister Mary married a Peter, and my cousin Mary married a Peter. So it is possible to have uh, a very popular name in a culture. Now, I do not want to focus on the identity of the woman, but what I want to focus on is what Jesus said to Simon in verse 47. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. When I read these words a while back ago, years ago, I got convicted. When I read these, ver these verses, when I read this verse in particular, I was convicted of my lack of love for Christ. I know that, that in, this life, in this life, I will, may never fully uh, and perfectly love God. But I have learned through um, growing as a Christian that there's nothing that can stop me from loving God as much as I could or for much as I can. And there's nothing stopping me to in this endeavor. The only person that is the only thing that is stopping me from loving God more today is me. <clears throat> but this morning, I want to spend some time in truth-telling. That's the title of our morning's message, 
truth teller. Uh, the truth needs to be told in love. And many I've been under some some preachers, and they tell they told you the truth, but it never came out of love. They, they were always sometimes some of them were rabid, and I always that always bothered me. It's like why are you so rabid? Where is the love of Christ? I don't see the love of Christ in your speech. The love of Christ should be manifest in our speech. Simon was a Pharisee, and as a Pharisee, he most likely took pride in the fact that he followed the law. He took pride that he tied even the spices from his spice garden, from his herb garden. Remember, the Bible says they tied uh, anise and mint. Uh, so when they grew spices, they actually would weigh out the spices and they would actually tie the spices. That's how, uh, to the extent, they wanted to follow the law. If he was a Pharisee, he probably took pride in the fact that he fasted. If he was a Pharisee, he probably took pride in the fact that he was faithful to his wife. And that overall, he was a better man than the IRS agent who lived across the street. Imagine how this man felt when Jesus looked to him and said, Simon, this woman loves me much, but you, you love me little. Imagine how he felt when Christ told him that. This woman, who is a sinner, Simon, this woman who is a woman of the street, Simon, this woman who you look down upon, loves me more than you do, Simon. Imagine how he felt. Imagine how you would feel when the, if the Lord would tell you this morning that you, uh, you uh, a successful uh, career person who has a good job, a good family, uh, you have not done anything wrong in your life, you've re let, re lived a relatively righteous life, uh, you're saved by the blood of the Lamb, uh, you love me little. That drug addict, that derelict down the street, who I just saved, loves me more than you do. How would you feel about that? If God would have revealed in what was inside your heart. Have you ever played the uh, I love you this much game with your child? You say, I love you this much. How much do you love me? And the child tries to outdo you. Eventually the child has his arm stretched out and uh, the child says, well, I love you this much, mommy, or I love you this much, daddy. With my son, it was, uh, we, we played that game of math. I love you 20 times. No, I love you 20 times 20. And then I introduced him the concept of infinity. I love you infinity. And then we were saying, I love you infinity squared. Well, I love you infinity times infinity. That was the game I played with my, with my son, Nathaniel. Well, with some kids, you can play that game. With some other kids, they're like, huh? <laughs> so, but you can't play this game with God. You can't say, God, well, I love you, uh, Father in heaven. I love you more than you love me. Well, that's impossible. Because our Father in Heaven demonstrated to us how much He really loved us by dying on the cross for our sins. Someone said, uh, I asked Jesus, how much do you love me? And He spread out His arms and He died on the cross. And that's how much Christ loves me. Now what I glean from this passage, that it is possible to love God by degrees. How can you say that? Well, it is possible because the Bible just told us that when Christ pointed to two people, now I believe Simon believed in Christ. Don't get me wrong. I don't doubt that Simon did not believe in Christ. Otherwise, why would he have him in his house? And Christ said to Simon, uh, I have forgiven you little, Simon. Therefore, you love me little. But this woman, she loves me much. Just like your heart. One of the things I, as I was growing up, I couldn't understand is why are some Christians more devoted than others to the cause of Christ? And God gave me the answer as I was studying the kings of Israel. You will find many times he followed God, yet not with a perfect heart. There are other times that you are, we are told that he prepared his heart and he followed God with a perfect heart. And sometimes they say that he did not prepare his heart. So it is possible to follow God, but not with a perfect heart, not with a completely perfect heart. I believe your heart can be divided between the affections on this earth and, and affections in heaven. Now, I believe there are some Christians who love God so much that they are willing to lay down their lives for His cause. Remember the young missionaries, one of the missionaries that comes to mind is Jim Elliot. At the age of 29, he died trying to reach the Wairani people in Ecuador. Paul was such a man who reached a level of spiritual maturity that he said he was willing to lay down his life for Christ. In 2 Timothy 4, 6, he says, For now I am ready to be offered. Does that come, are those words from a man who loved God with, loved God a little? 
Those words from a man who loved God with all his heart. He said, I am ready to be offered. He didn't say, I'm ready to die for God. He said, I'm ready to be offered as a lamb upon the altar. And he says, the time of my departure is at hand. I am ready to be offered. I am ready, God. I'm ready for you to take me the way you want to take me, Lord. If you want to crucify me, Lord. If you want me to languish in a prison somewhere, Lord. If you want me to be burned at the stake, Lord. If you want them to uh, lop my head off, Lord. Whatever it is, Lord, I am ready to be offered. In our Western world, we have a big problem. And there's a big but in our lives. And this is our affluence. Uh, no pun intended, but I just realized what I just said. Uh, affluence can result in this big, uh, what we just mentioned before. <clears throat> we study hard to get the acclaim, to the, get to the acclaimed school so that we can graduate and get the big job afterwards. We work hard to expand our business and double our income. We work extra long hours to, so we can bank a lot of overtime. So we can go on vacation somewhere. Or we go back to school and earn the extra degree so that we can get promoted and get the extra income that comes along with that. But have you ever heard of a person or a Christian say, what more can I do for God? What else can I give up for God? What sin should I crucify on the cross? Or what desire do I have in my heart that is keeping me from experiencing God at a deeper level? When's the last time you said that? When's the last time I said that? When's the last time you sat and examined your life and you said, is there anything in my life of God that I need to remove? Mark chapter 4, 19, the Bible says, And the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things, entering choke the word, and they become unfruitful. Many of us know this verse. We get stuck at the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. But have we ever considered the third thing that Jesus said? That Jesus added, which evades us often, and it says, the lust of other things. What are these other things that we lust after? Uh, could, perhaps it's relationships, perhaps it's hobbies, perhaps it's uh, sports, perhaps it's whatever it is. Fill in the blank. That's what I believe this is. Jesus said, the lust of, fill in the blank. If you lust after it, Bible says it will choke your work. Your gardens. Do you lust after your gardens? One of the things I'm getting uh, with this coronavirus, my family and I were doing a lot of tree planting and a lot of yard work. And uh, sometimes I, I consider and I, I think about this and I meditate and I say, do, am I spending too much time planting trees versus reading the Word of God and praying? We all, we all uh, are subject to lust after other things. These other things are the things that keep our heart from God. I believe we are living in a day and age today where Christians can't handle the truth. You can't preach to them about purity, about holiness, about integrity, about sobriety, about sacrifice. They can't handle it. Listen to what Paul tells the Hebrew Christians. Out of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Paul says there's so much I want to teach you. There's so much I want to tell you. But you guys are dull of hearing. In verse 12, he says, For the time when you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. You know what the difference between a, uh, an infant and a young child is? The infant needs meat, milk. The infant will be choked out if you start giving him a steak. Imagine how Luke trying to chew on a steak. He couldn't do it. But once he gets older, I guarantee you that he's going to be chopping at the stake and his dad will be uh, watching in amazement. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. I don't know where that came from. But i got to be careful because Colossians 2.16 tells us that I'm not supposed to judge my brothers in meat or drink. Uh, again, we just we have, to, we have some fun with it. We don't, we don't mean any harm. We just have some fun with it. Um, you know, we have some vegetarians that, uh, that don't like vegetables. So that... Uh, <laughs> I'm not giving any names, I'm just having fun this morning, because of what I'm about to preach. Sometimes when the Lord lays a, a heavy uh, topic on my heart, that I, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have, I know I'm going to have a hard time preaching it, I, I like to joke about it, because uh, it helps me, to be honest with you. So I'm not picking on you because I hate you. They say, it, uh, I pick on you because I like you. You heard that expression? Uh, the guys at work, when I was in South Carolina, 
they would pick on me because uh, they would call me the illegal alien because they knew I was from Canada. And uh, that's what they would call me. I, I, I went along with it. I said, I'm not, I'm not illegal, I'm legal, I have papers. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what they all say. <laughs> but I had fun with it. And he says, you know why we pick on you? Because we like you. I said, I understand, I understand. That's a great way of showing me that you like me, by <laughs> But that's human nature, and that's, that, that's good too. But listen to what Paul tells the Corinthian Christians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. You know, the desire for Paul was to teach the Corinthians the, the deep things of God, but he says, I can't. I can't because you can't handle it. You can't handle the truth. He says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Yet, neither yet now are you able. Imagine if someone comes up to you and says, you know what your problem is? You can't handle the truth. There's so much I want to tell you, but I know if I were to preach to you what I want to preach to you, if I want to teach to you what I want to teach to you, you won't handle it. Because you're yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? Look at your own life as a Christian. There are some things that you no longer do now, but you used to do 5, 10, 20, 15 years ago. Why? Because God has gently matured you. He's shown you. Uh, when you were not ready, God did not tell you, stop this thing. But when you were ready, God says, okay, you're ready now. I no longer want you to do this thing. I no longer want you to watch this. I, don't, I no longer want you to go there. God doesn't do that when, you're a, when you just get saved. He's gentle on you. He, he slowly matures you. One of the things that strikes me as I, ver as I observe uh, Christians today is their lack of biblical knowledge and their lack of understanding. I grew up in a church that had messed up doctrines and it almost made me resent my parents. So here I am as a young, as a, as a well not a young teen, an, a, an older teen, and I'm studying the scriptures, I'm reading the word of God, and I'm coming to the understanding that the things that my parents taught me are not in the scriptures. Where'd you come up with these weird doctrines? Uh, and then I went to a Presbyterian church, and I got so excited because I started learning the Word of God again. And after a few years in the Presbyterian church, learning more of the Word of God, I said, well, that's not in the Bible. Where'd they find sprinkling in the Bible? where do they find this in the Bible? where do they find that in the Bible? And then I went to a Baptist church. And then I was there, and I got, started growing some more. And then the pastor changed his doctrine for financial gain. Then I got discouraged again. Then I started going to a non-denominational church. And you know what happened to me in the non-denominational church? I died. Because it was not meat. They couldn't give you the meat. You know what happens when you give meat sometimes. People choke. They, they, they run out. They, go, they, they head for the emergency center. I'm choking. It's too much meat. I can't handle it. Then I started going to a Bible-believing Baptist church in Alberg, Vermont, 65 miles south of my home. And then I started growing again. And what I realized, it's the teaching and preaching of this book that causes growth. And I don't mean any Bible. I mean the King James Bible. Oh, you, 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 you're going to tell me that people that use other versions don't grow? I'm not saying that. But I've seen a difference in the, in the type of growth that occurs those who, who stick to the right book. When you start teaching the meat of the word, you're going to lose some members. You're going to upset some others. You're going to step on some toes. And I believe that's why pastors uh, tone it down a little. They are afraid of thinning the herd. It hurts their income. But when a pastor starts fearing losing church members over fearing God, the church becomes lukewarm. We have the mentality today that you are serving customers, not challenging saints. We start feeling comfortable in church, then there's something wrong. If I feel comfortable with what I'm preaching, there's something wrong with me. There always has to be an edge. There always has to be some slight of, uh, of, of uh, nervousness when you're preaching a message because you're handling the Word of God. The Holy Spirit's uh, job is not only to comfort you, but also to convict you. Christians today... Shudder of Holy Ghost conviction. We're afraid that if we 
uh, ask the customers to be and do what God wants them to do, that they will no longer be our customers. We may lose them down to the church down the road. And I've thought about this sometimes myself, and my, I find my prayer today is, Lord, give us church to want to give us people in the church that want to serve you. It's not about numbers. I'd rather have 10, 20, 30 people who want to serve God than a hundred who want to be tickled, who want, who want to have their ears tickled. Uh, they will go down the church who will cater to them, coddle them, console them, and not push them to do anything. I tell our people in our church, if God lays something on your heart to do, do it. You don't have to come and ask me. If God lays on your heart to call someone, call them. If God lays on your heart to visit someone, visit them. This is not my church. This is our church. And if it's our church, it's God's church. And I trust that God will work in the hearts of every one of you here differently. You have some gifts. You may have a way with people. God may use you to visit people. God may use you to speak to people. Uh, you may have the gift of evangelism. You may have the gift of teaching. My prayer is that God uses each and every one of us in, the capa in our own capacity. I don't want to tell people that all is well and all is fine. Just the way you are. Uh, God loves you. Uh, yes, God loves you just the way you are. But He doesn't want you to stay the way you are. We are afraid to tell people today that the Holy Spirit has endorsed the King James Bible. Mm -hmm. There's a spirit mixed in with these new versions. Uh, now, I'm not going to say that people cannot get saved out of them. I'm not saying that God cannot speak to you through the new versions. But what I'm telling you is that there's a spirit that is mixed in with these new versions. Right. We are afraid to tell people that Hollywood is straight from hell. And Christians ought to have nothing with this godless organization. We're afraid to tell them this. We're afraid to tell them that if you back a politician who believes in pro-choice, who believes in abortion, you're sinning. How can you support someone who condones murder? I don't care what political party they're part of. I'm not here to endorse any political party. If a candidate says abortion is okay, then what are you doing supporting them? Do you not know that abortion is a modern form of Moloch worship? Study it out. What was the problem with the, the, the Jews in the Old Testament? They sacrificed their children to Molech. And abortion is nothing more than worshipping this god Molech in today's day and age. We're afraid to tell them that some of this music that is called Christian contemporary music is nothing more than rock and roll with nice words to it. I use this illustration. It's like going to a strip club and hearing the stripper tell you the gospel of Christ. Does that make it right? Think about it. Does that make it right? Or going to a bar and having the bartender teach you about uh, eschatology while you're drinking, uh, uh, while you're getting drunk. That's what some of this music is today. We're afraid to tell people these things because all oh, we're afraid they're going to get offended and leave our church. We're afraid to tell them if they allow their son or their daughter to date a lost person that you're committing a sin. Did you know in 1 Corinthians, Paul tells that a man has a rule over his own daughter that he can tell her she can get married or not get married? That's New Testament teaching. Did you know that? Study it out in 1 Corinthians. A man has power over his own daughter that he can tell her she can or cannot get married. It's New Testament doctrine. But people can't handle the truth. You tell them that if they do not discipline their children, they are sending them to hell. You are paving the way for your child to go to hell if you don't spank them. Oh, what are you saying? That's the truth from the scripture. When I got that verse, when, when I, I'm going to tell you, when I was younger I, and I was single, I couldn't understand how a parent could hit their child. I mean, when I say hit, I'm not talking about abuse. I'm talking about spanking. I couldn't understand it. I was very mild-mannered. I couldn't even hurt a fly. Even though I, I was taking Taekwondo and I could have kicked somebody's teeth out, I still couldn't hurt a person. Then I came across this verse, and you know what, ha what happened to me? I got so afraid. And when I had children, I was so afraid of me not following God's word. I said, oh, Lord, help me properly discipline my children because I don't want to pave the road to hell for them. Man, discipline. I'm not talking about abuse. Every time Christians talk about uh, spanking their children, they say, oh, abuse. No, I don't, I've never abused my children. I try not to, at least. You know, I may have thrown, kicked them down a little bit. No, that's just when we're practicing karate. But, you know, they've kicked me too. But I'm talking about, I'm talking about proper discipline. If you love your children, you will discipline them. Because you don't want them to end up in hell. The Bible says this. We're afraid to remind them that our spiritual forefathers 
They died. They were burned at the stake. They were tortured. They were persecuted. And they have nothing of value in this life because they were constantly on the run. It's only in the last couple of hundred years that Christians have uh, uh, accumulated any wealth. Matthew 5, Jesus reminds his disciples, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know the Bible says that the godly shall suffer persecution? The godly shall suffer persecution. So let me ask you this, how much persecution are we suffering today? They close, they don't let us meet in church and we feel we're persecuted. In verse 11 he says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. When's the last time somebody ridiculed you for being a Christian? Like really, really reviled you. It rarely happens in our day and age. Uh, they reject the gospel track and our feelings get hurt. And he says, and they say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And have you ever read in the Bible what they did to the prophets? They stoned them. One of the prophets was actually sawn in half with a, with a saw. They put him on a tree and then they sawed him in half. I believe that was Jeremiah. Pastor, you're being so hard. Well, sometimes you have to be hard. Remember what Jesus told the Pharisee? Simon, she loved much, but you, Simon, you love me little. I don't want to be one of those Christians when God, when I appear before the judgment seat of Christ and Christ looks at me and he said, you love me little. That would break my heart. Just thinking about it breaks my heart. When you have children, do you want your children to love you little? Or do you want your children to love you much? Do you love God a little or do you love God much? I'm going to tell you this morning that your reception of the truth is an, indi is an indicator of how much you love God. Do you know that? Truth telling. John 3.19 says, And this is the condemnation, the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Now I'm not saying that this verse applies to Christians, but there's a principle on that. The amount of truth that you love is, is, is uh, an indicator of the closeness you are with God. How much do you love God? Do you know that Jesus said, I am the truth? So if you love God, then you will love truth, no matter what the truth is, no matter how the truth, uh, no matter if the truth rubs you the wrong way or offends your sensitivities. <clears throat> In Galatians 4.16, Paul laments and he writes to the Galatians, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? The Galatians had reverted back to their old ways. They had turned again to the weak and beggarly elements of this world. They, des they desired to go back to the bondage of sin. When you knowingly disobey God and you knowingly commit sin, you know what you're doing? You're putting yourself into bondage of sin. You're telling sin, sin take me, oh sin take me into your hands, I lay my flesh, have your way with me sin, I want to be your slave. That's what you're doing when you are committing sin, willful sin. I want to tell our young people this morning and, old, and our old folk too, guard your heart, guard your heart. And Jeremiah 79 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? <clears throat> your own heart will lie to you. And this is the truth I'm about to tell you this morning. The problem is you and I have a bad heart. A heart that will lie to us, a heart that will lead us astray, a heart that will paint a rosy picture regarding sin, a heart that will equivocate and compromise and vacillate. That's the kind of heart we have. Yes, we have a new heart uh, through the new birth. Christ gave us a new heart, but we still have our old heart. And the reason and, uh, and what we have to endeavor to do is try to get close to God so that through the power of the Holy Spirit, that new heart can take over. So that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we cannot listen to the old heart. You can't handle the truth as just more than a line in the movie. Too many Christians say they want the truth. You give it to them and they ignore it. And when you give it to them again, you become their enemy. Remember the time when Jesus taught the disciples regarding eating and drinking his flesh? Eating his flesh and drinking his blood? And what happened? The disciples said, this is a hard saying. And John 6:66 6, says, From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then Christ turns to the twelve and he says, Will you also go away? Could you imagine how hurt Christ must have felt? Here he is teaching them the truth. 
telling them the truth that he received from God the Father. And what did they do? They walked away on him. They couldn't handle the truth. And then he turns to the twelve and he says, Will you also go away? The thing that tells me about Christ, even though he was hurt, he wasn't afraid of preaching the truth, even if it meant him standing alone. And alone he did stand. Right before his accusers, he was alone. Everyone forsook him. Here is the Son of God, the heart for truth. And here he is, standing all alone. Research states that the number one reason for the decline in church attendance is that members attend with less frequency than they did yesterday. They say church membership has not gone down. It's church attendance that has gone down. People's faithfulness to the church has declined. And Jesus gives us the reason why. Because thou art lukewarm, I will spew thee out. How's that for truth? A gentle Savior says to you and I, if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out. How's that for truth? Can, would you be able to stand before Christ and Him look at you and me and say, you're lukewarm. I'm going to spit you out. You can justify all your lukewarmness all you want. You can justify why you don't pray. You can justify why you don't tithe. You can justify why you don't sow. And you can justify why you don't go to church. You can justify all these things. It doesn't matter. Christ in the end will say, I'm going to spit you out. Is your love for God strong enough that you can handle the truth however which way it comes to you? I'm not saying this to put myself on a pedestal. But I knew from a young man, I wanted the truth. Hit me right between the eyes. I don't care how much it hurts. All I want is the truth. Is that kind of heart you have this morning? Are you a person that says, give me the truth? I don't care how much it hurts me. I love the truth so much that I'm willing to die for it. Or are you the type of person who doesn't want to know the truth, but wants to know what you already believe is the truth? In the early 1900s, George Riddle acquired the sensational London newspaper, The News of the World. One day, George Riddle met British journalist Frederick Greenwood, and he mentioned that he owned the newspaper. And he told Greenwood its name, and then offered that he would send him a free copy. The next time they met, Riddle asked Greenwood what he thought of the news of the world. What did you think of my newspaper? And the uh, journalist said, I looked at it, and then I put it in the waste paper, ba waste paper basket. And then I thought, well, if I leave it there, the cook may read it. So then I burned it, he said. This is what you ought to do with the truths that you hold that are contrary to the scriptures. Burn them, even if it hurts your feelings. One of the things, one of my prayers is, Lord, give me the truth. I don't care how it hurts. I don't care how it's contrary to my uh, predispositions or preconceived ideas. I just want the truth. Once the devil was walking along with one of his cohorts. They saw a man ahead of them picking up something shiny. What did he find? asked the cohort. A piece of truth, the devil replied. Doesn't it bother you that he found a piece of truth? Asked the cohort. No, said the devil. I will see to it that he makes a religion out of it. You and I cannot stand only on one truth that we find in the scriptures. You got to be careful about the ministries that make their, that make their, that they revolve around one issue. One issue ministries. You got to be careful of those things. Because what will happen is that you'll create a cult. We know many uh, so-called independent Baptists that have created cults because they stand only on one issue. They forget everything else. You can't just have one issue. You must preach the whole truth. In Acts 27, Paul said, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. You can't just be a, a one-issue Christian or a one-issue preacher. You have to take the whole counsel of God. It is a detriment today to Christians at churches that pastors do not teach systematic theology. They don't teach on theology proper. They don't teach on soteriology, chronology, eschatology, ecclesiology, angelology, and all these other ologies. All oh, those are $25 word. Well, we've taken the, uh, the truths in the Bible and we've categorized them so we can better disseminate them. Why aren't these being taught in the church? Why are people afraid to teach about the end times? Why are they afraid? The danger, though, is when you broach these subjects, when you broach the meat of the Word of God, there are differing opinions oftentimes. 
And when, uh, with differing, differing opinions often come uh, tempers. And tempers flare when you don't teach something that someone doesn't believe. And you always fall into the trap. Who's right? Well, I'm right. You didn't know that? No, I'm just kidding here. Someone said, I am not arguing. I am simply explaining why I am right. Uh, someone gave some great marriage advice. And he says, in marriage you can be right or you can be happy. And I choose to be happy. That's just a jest. That's a joke, by the way. So you can argue how many demons can dance on the head of a pin, but you still must be a lover of the truth. The truth regarding ourselves and how the Bible instructs us to live, you need to love that. Yes, it's great to uh, get all the little gold nuggets. Yes, it's great to study dispensations. Yes, it's great to study eschatology. But above all, you need to study morality. How does God require you and I to live? In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus gives an idea of what it means to love God much. In Matthew 10, 37, the Bible says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. And as Christians, we are to love God more than anything else. Have you examined that in your life? Is it something that you love more than God? Do you love your relationships more than God? Do you love your career more than God? Do you love your plans or ideas for your life more than God? As Christians, we are to love God more than anything else in life. Would you be willing to give up anything for God? I've often asked myself that. If God told you right now, I want you to sell all you have and go become a missionary, would you do it? Are you willing to do that, drop everything you have? And go become a missionary. God, if, they, if God clearly showed you that's what he wanted you to do. Jim Elliott was one of five missionaries killed in 1956 while trying to evangelize the Waurani people of Ecuador. He was passionate for Christ, who journaled many of his thoughts and prayers. One such entry addressed his concern about impact. He wrote, Father, make me a man of crisis. Bring those I contact to decision." Let me not be a milepost on a single road. Make me a fork. That men must turn one way or another on facing Christ in me. Wow. Think about those words. Is that kind of desire that you have? That you are such that you make such an impact in the lives of people that when they run into you, they have to make a decision. Today his impact continues. I heard the testimony of one of his son's friends. And you see the man who killed him smiling from ear to ear because now he has Christ in his heart. Mm -hmm. He died over 60 years ago at the age of 29. And he had grasped this truth at such a young age. Read some of his uh, uh, writings in his, in his personal diary. Very, very powerful. I think he had re reached a level of surrender to God that God decided to take him home. And Enoch walked with God and God took him. Many times when you see some people and they die in the prime, say, oh, he died in his prime. Could it be that he walked with God, that God said, I'm going to take him because I want him home with me? Someone said, if you walk through a field of beautiful flowers, what do you do? You pick one. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, we saw a beautiful flower. It was uh, me and someone else saw the flower. We were in our yard. And, oh, I saw a flower. What a beautiful flower. And next thing I know, someone is, one of my sons is holding it in his hands. He picked it, because it was the only flower in the field. The truth had grabbed a hold of this young man, and I pray that the truth has grabbed a hold of me, and may dig its prong so deep that I cannot let it go. And I pray that's your desire this morning, that the truth may, may grab a hold of you so hard and so powerfully that you never want to let it go. May you develop the desire and the willingness to forsake all for the cause of Christ. I'm not saying all of us have to give up our jobs and our homes and our families, but I don't know what, your, uh, what God's will is for your life, but you have to have that willingness in your heart. May you love the truth more than you love anything else in this life. And I want to remind you of this truth, that it is possible for you to love God by degrees. Don't be impressed by a person's intelligence, degrees, affluence, or influence, but be impressed on how much they love the God of Israel. How much do you love the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Our world is so confused today because they have forsaken the truth of the scriptures. They have hated the truths found in this book. 
Am I a girl? Am I a boy? Can a man marry a man? When does life begin? How was the earth made? Can a woman be a pastor or a deacon? What Bible should I use? Do you sprinkle or do you dunk? When do you get the Holy Spirit? Do you tithe? Tithing is not in the New Testament. I don't need to go to church. I can dress the way I want. I can date who I want. I can choose what to obey. Where does this all mess come from? Have you ever thought about that? Why our world is so confused today? It comes from a lack of knowledge of the Word of God. It comes from a lack of love of the truth. If you loved the truth, you would search it out. In Proverbs 4, 6, we've been studying the book of Proverbs. And this uh, verse says, Forsake her not, regarding wisdom, and she shall preserve thee. Love her. You ought to love wisdom. And where does wisdom come from? It comes from this book. Love her, and she shall keep thee. What a promise we have from the Word of God. Hosea 4, 6, the Bible says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I also forget thy children. One of the dangers of parents not following God is it will come out on their children. All I have to do is look at my family members. My mom and my dad got saved. And now me and my sisters are all saved and serving God. And then I see my cousins. What was the difference between me and my cousins? I had saved parents. They didn't. See how that works? I believe the principle that when a, when a, when a father and mother get saved, that their children will also get saved. If they do the right thing. If they do the right thing. God laments at the condition of his people and provides a diagnosis, rejection of knowledge. How many people do you know that reject the knowledge of the truth? Whenever you reject knowledge, you bring destruction upon yourself. Young person, if you're listening to me this morning or if you're listening to me online, if you reject the wisdom of this book, your life will be destroyed. Oh, it's not going to happen to me. It will happen to everyone else that rejected this book. Don't think you're going you're gonna to be spared from it. Do not let go of the truths found in this book. Love them. And I can assure you, your life will end up okay. God has the best for you in mind. Never forget that. God has the best for you. Never forget that. The world doesn't have the best for you. The world wants to take you, destroy you, and spit you up. They will present to the presence with a nice shiny object. Oh, look how beautiful this is. In John 15, the Bible says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. we got to love the truth. And if I love the truth, then I will love you. And if I love the truth, I will, will, will love to tell you the truth, regardless of how it hurts me or how it hurts you. And the ultimate demonstration as we, as we come to a close, I want to point out the ultimate demonstration of love is the extent that you are willing to lay down your life for the brethren. Do I love you enough that when push comes to shove, that I will, my, that I will lay my life down for you? I've actually asked myself this question. If push came to shove, if there came a day that I had to give my life up for any one of my family or someone in the church, would I be willing to do that? Would I be willing to lay down my life? Sergeant Rafael Peralta had a reputation for putting the interests of his fellow Marines ahead of his own. He demonstrated that for the last time on November 5th, November 15th, 2004, by making the ultimate sacrifice during a firefight in Fallujah. Sergeant Rafael Peralta became what his comrades respectfully called a Marine Marine that day. He had built a reputation as a leader, and he had always put the interests of his men first. Half a dozen Marines were there, and they saw the events unfold. They said there was an exchange of fire with the enemy in Fallujah. Peralta was shot in the head, and yet the Marines say when a grenade landed near him, he was able to grab it, and he tucked it underneath his chest, and he gave his life to save the lives of the other Marines. Would you do that for a buddy? You say, of course I would. If I were in the middle of a firefight, I would gladly lose my life for my buddy. Would you do that for a derelict? Would you do that for a street lady? Would you do that for a drug addict? Would you do that for a good-for-nothing husband or an abusive father? How about for a sex offender? Would you do that? Would you lay down your life for them? It becomes a lot harder when you think of it in those terms. 
And I know some of us, the answer would be, there's no way I would give up my life for a, for a person like that. But you see, that's what God did. Mm. Not only did He do that for them, He did it for me and you. It was us who were driving the nails in His hands. And as the, think about this, as the soldiers were driving the nails in His hands, you know what He said? As they were driving the nails, in Luke 23, 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. I heard a testimony of Rembrandt and some others that were tortured for Christ. They prayed for their captors. They felt sorry for them. They realized that they were victims. Imagine praying for someone who was torturing you. And praying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I want us to endeavor to love God more and more each day. The hymn writer penned these words, The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more that I love him, more love he bestows. Each day is like heaven, and my heart overflows. Pablo Castles was considered the greatest cellist to ever live. When he was 95 years old, he was asked why he continued to practice six hours a day, and he answered, because I think I'm making progress. Mm. Because I think I'm making progress. And that's what it should be with us. Every day, you need to make progress. You need to endeavor to love God more and more. I want to encourage you to purpose in your heart to love God more today than you did yesterday and to love God more tomorrow than you do today. If you want to love God better, hate sin more. Someone said, I would rather stand with God and be judged by the world than stand with the world and be judged by God. How about you this morning? Would you rather love God? Would you rather love God or the world? And I tell you the truth, based on the Word of God, it is possible to love God by degrees. Simon loved God a little. That woman, her name is not named, but she loved him much. And I believe it is possible to love God as much as this woman did. She poured the ointment over his feet. She wept tears of gladness. She mourned. She recognized what Christ had done for her. And she wiped his feet with her hairs. Could you do something like that for Jesus? Could you? Many of us wouldn't. Oh, I'm going to wipe my hairs with his feet. Yeah, but he, he died for you. If it wasn't for his death, you'd be in hell right now. How much do we owe him? You see, this woman knew she was going to hell. She was a sinner. There was no doubt in her mind. She was a woman of the street. But Jesus forgave her. She goes, oh, I no longer have to worry about my sins. I no longer have to worry about my sins taking me to hell. He promised her eternal life, and she never forgot it. It meant so much for her. That's why she was willing to cry over his feet and wipe her hair with his feet. Because that's how much her salvation, she wiped his feet with her hairs. That's how much her salvation meant to her. Does your salvation mean that much to you? That you will love Jesus much for it? I pray that this is your heart this morning. And I pray I have not become your enemy for telling you the truth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord God. We pray that you give us a love for the truth. We pray you give us a love for the absolute truth. There are so many isms and schisms today, Lord God. So many interpretations of doctrine. So many Bible versions. So many different modes of worship. So many, I can go on and on and on. But deep down in my heart, Lord God, I know there's only one way. I know there's only one truth. I know there's only one book. I know there's only one way to worship you. And I pray you give this heart to your people this morning. That they may love truth more than anything else. 